Hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this webinar all about unpacking phonics in the classroom. Um, if you haven't joined a webinar that I've hosted before or seen me on the socials, my name is Holly and I've been working at Teach Data for almost seven years now. Prior to that, I was an early years teacher through and through. So um, this topic for a webinar was certainly something that I was super, super excited um, to chat with you all about. So thank you again for joining us. Phonics has been one of my passions when I was in the classroom, but also through my time at Teach Data, I've helped create some phonics resources. I've also helped write some blogs where we've sought external um, advice from experts in the field and all of the research that comes with phonics and teaching our kids to read. Um, also keeping up to date on what teachers are doing in the classroom on Instagram, which I also absolutely love, which is why I'm super excited to share that Tam from Miss Learning Bee, I'll get one of the staff members who is online um, right now to share her, um, her page or her Instagram page, will be sharing some of her insights, hints and tips, um, and evidence-based ways that she has taught phonics in her kindergarten classroom as well. So she's recorded three mini tutes, um, which we'll be sharing today. So I'm super excited to have her on board. So thanks again, Tam. Um, just a few housekeeping things before we get started. Um, if you've joined our webinar before, you'll know that we like to use the chat function for any questions that you might have throughout the webinar. Um, we've got some delightful staff online answering those questions um, as we speak. So thanks to those staff members. Uh, we try to get to all of the questions in our webinars, but we can often get um, inundated. So um, bear with us. If your question doesn't get answered, what we'll do is I'll be online in our Facebook group called Teacher Talk. So make sure you join that Facebook group um, and I'll be online there after this webinar. So you can post your question in the um, Facebook group there and we'll make sure that we answer all of the questions in that group just to make sure that we can get to everyone. All righty, let's get started. So in this webinar, I am going to cover exactly what phonics is, as well as go over some terms or phonics terms that you'll often hear, you'll hear throughout this webinar, but you'll also hear when talking about phonics instruction in the classroom. Now, whether you're an early years teacher, experienced early years teacher, or whether you're an upper years teacher or middle years teacher, um, or you're new to teaching, I want to make sure that I start with those basics so that you do understand exactly what those terms mean. Um, and sometimes it's nice as a refresher, even if you know those terms, you've been an early years teacher for many, many years, it's just nice to have a refresher and you never know, you might learn something new. We'll also talk about phonics instruction, so best practice, and that's where Tam will be joining us for her first mini shoot. Super excited to show you that. Um, and I'll also, also be jumping in after that shoot just to share some other ideas and activities that you could use. We'll talk about sound walls and how sound walls can help in your phonics instruction in the classroom. We will talk about the importance of explicitly teaching blending and segmenting and how that might look in your classroom. And we'll also touch on the topic of tr tricky words or also known as heart words. You might have heard of them as heart words. Um, and we'll just talk about that shift away from learning sight words as whole words um, and helping our kids learn those tricky parts of those words, but being able to decode other aspects in that word. So um, Tam will also be joining us with a mini cheat for that topic as well. All right, let's get into it. So what is phonics? Phonics focuses on how sounds look in writing. Um, in phonics instruction, students will learn the relationship between those letters on the page and the sounds that they make. This then in turn helps our students when decoding words when they're reading and encoding when they're writing. So it's a super, super important part of the early years classroom. I wanted to pop this diagram here. I'm sure you've seen many of these before with slightly different topics. Um, Perhaps your school use a, uses a phonics program or a, a reading program that highlights other aspects, but it just gives you a bird's eye view of where phonics sits in the larger scope and sequence of teaching our kids to read and write. 
obviously, as early years teachers, oral languages is, is at the heart. That's why we've got that in the middle. You've got phonics and decoding, which this webinar is going to be about, but you've also got comprehension, phonological and phonemic awareness, vocabulary, fluency, and print concepts. Okay, so we just wanted to put that diagram there to highlight, yes, this webinar is about phonics. Um, it's a big aspect of teaching our kids to read, but there are also other areas that need to be covered. Okay, I said I was going to go over some terms, so I'll quickly go over these. We've spoken about what phonics is. Now, what is phonemic awareness? Often I've heard teachers use these interchangeably, but they're actually quite different. So phonemic awareness is the understanding that spoken words are made up of individual sounds and it's 100% auditory. Okay, so that's, that's the real difference is it's auditory. It's the, the students being able to hear the sounds in words. We've got grapheme and phoneme there. So grapheme is a letter or group of letters that represent a sound and a phoneme is a speech sound made by the mouth self-explanatory. So a grapheme might be C and H together. The phoneme is CH. Uh, the grapheme might be S and H together and the phoneme is SH. Okay, so the phoneme is the sound, the grapheme are the letters on the page. In the previous slide I spoke about decoding and encoding. So decoding is the ability to apply knowledge of letter sound relationships to pronounce written words. So that's being able to decode our words when we read. Encoding is the process of hearing a sound and being able to write that symbol. So that's basically hearing a word, breaking that into sounds and being able to then write that word in the correct formation. All right, orthographic mapping. Now, when I was in the classroom, I actually had never heard this term. And I'm going to be honest with things that I might not have heard in the classroom, but I have learnt throughout my time watching other teachers on Instagram or researching or chatting to experts. So uh, Tam will touch on orthographic mapping in the tricky words part of this webinar, but it's basically the process that we use to permanently store words into our long-term memory, which, was, which is why we've got that shift away from learning words as whole words for sight words for most students, and rather learning how to decode and also then learning by heart those tricky aspects in those words. So as I read off this slide today, I am not decoding every single word because the words in my long-term memory um, have ensured that I'm now a confident reader and I can read these words quickly to you. Other terms that you might hear throughout this webinar or in phonics programs include a digraph, which is two letters coming together to make one sound, a triograph, which is three letters coming together to make one sound, the schwa sound, so this is like the lazy sound. It can be a little bit different depending on your accent. So if you are from a different country, there might be slightly different ways to pronounce things, but it's sort of that uh sound, the lazy uh, never, under, about, away. Um, so it can occur at the end or start or in the middle of words. It's often known as the, the lazy sound. I've actually hyperlinked the word schwa there to remind me that I have written a blog with all of this content, all of the resources, all of the terms, everything, so that um, you don't have to sit there and write this all out. And in that blog, I've actually included a really cute video. I think she's an American teacher and she's got this really cute song that she sings to help her students understand what the schwa sound is. So um, make sure you check out, we'll direct you to that blog at the end of this webinar. So let's get into the nitty gritty. So this is where we've got the lovely Tam joining us. And in this mini tute, she's going to be talking about the importance of building phonological and phonemic awareness and building strong foundations orally. So that's then going back to that diagram where we had oral language at the heart of all of this. She'll talk about the importance of your phonics program. And of course, you might be at a school where you're using a phonics program or you might be starting from scratch and you, you are needing some hints and tips. She'll talk about the importance of this being explicit, systematic and consistent. She'll also talk about the importance of students pronouncing the sounds correctly. And also as the early years teacher, as you're teaching those sounds to those students, you are also pronouncing those, those sounds correctly. 
of course, in the early years, repetition, repetition, repetition is so, so important in lots of different aspects of the classroom um, and lots of different ways of teaching those sounds to students. And she will touch on the order of the sounds. We often get asked, what order do we teach the sounds to our students? So um, she'll touch on what she does in the classroom and I'll also share some of my past experience and what I have found um, in, in research as well. All right, take it away, Tan. Hello and welcome to our first mini tutorial, which is all about how we introduce sounds to students. Now, phonics is the process of getting students to make connections between the sounds that they can hear and the written symbols that make those sounds. It's really important that we remember that students are unable to do in print what they cannot do orally. So what that means is in the lead up to introducing sounds to students and as we are introducing sounds to students, we need to make sure that we are building their phonological and their phonemic awareness. So we need to be making sure we have explicit lessons around that and that we also then continue to build that into our phonics lessons, maybe as a warm up, so that we are making sure they've got really, really strong foundations that are then going to equip them with all of their phonics learning in order to be able to read and to write. So the goal when we are introducing sounds to students is that we need to be able, them to be able to look at that sound and to recognize it automatically because we need them to be able to then do that with a whole number of sounds in order to be able to read different words. And if they're having to stop and think about what each of those sounds are, that's going to create this huge cognitive load for them. And it's going to really, really impact their ability to be able to decode those words and then to be able to read. So we want to get that really automatic recall happening of different sounds. So how do we do that? We need to make sure that our phonics instruction and our introduction of sounds is explicit. We need it to be systematic and we need it to be consistent. So I'm gonna walk you through what each of those different parts looks like. So first of all, we need to explicitly model and teach the sounds to our students. We need to model the correct mouth formation and it can be really handy to have pictures of the mouth formation that you can be using with students as well. And we also need to ensure that they are correctly pronouncing the sounds. So what I mean by that is that they're not adding extra little bits to the sound. So for example, with the sound p, they're saying it like that. They're not saying p. Or with the ul sound, they're not saying l. And the reason for that is when they are then going to try and use those sounds and put them together to read words, if they're adding those extra little bits to the sounds, that's gonna make it so much harder for them to blend those sounds together. So if they were doing the word log, for example, and they're saying l, then they're trying to say l, Oh, l, oh, and that's much harder than if they're going l, and they're correctly pronouncing the l, and they're able to easily blend it into the next sound. So we need to explicitly model those cor correct pronunciations and the correct mouth formation, and lots and lots and lots of repetition of that. Next, we need to make sure that our phonics instruction is systematic. So we need to make sure that we are introducing students to all of the sounds in a really logical sequential order. So we start with the most common sounds and then we gradually introduce the less common sounds as students are building that phonics knowledge. When you're first teaching the single sounds, I recommend teaching them in a set or a group of sounds of six or eight sounds. Now I've got SAP in here because that's a common first set of sounds that are used in a lot of phonics programs. You may have a program that uses a slightly different set of first sounds and it doesn't really matter which set of first sounds you use, you just wanna make sure you've got some common consonants and a couple of vowel sounds. Now the benefit to teaching a set of sounds over a group of weeks rather than just a single sound at a time is that students are then immediately working with those sounds in the context of words. And they're learning to apply that knowledge of being able to recognize that sound to then blend and read simple decodable words and possibly even write those decodable words. The other benefit is that we are then not just teaching students to recognize these sounds at the start of words. So you may have in the past taught at, for example, as at is for apple and at is for astronaut. And that's how I used to teach it when I was first um, teaching my kindergarten class years and years ago. The problem is that though, when you think about it, that doesn't make any sense because these students are just learning how to read. They don't know how to read words like apple and astronaut. But by doing it in this way, we are then teaching students to not only recognize those sounds at the start of words, but also in the middle and at the end of words as well. So for example, we've got the put sound here, we've got it at the start of the word in pin, and we've got it at the end of the word in tap. 
or we've got it at the start of the word in ant or the middle of the word in sat. Lastly, we need to be really consistent with our phonics instruction. We need to be giving students lots and lots and lots of opportunities to be exposed to the sounds and be interacting and working with those sounds so that their letter sound knowledge and their application of that knowledge becomes automatic and second nature to them. So what does that look like? We need to be doing consistent, explicit phonics lessons every single day. These don't need to take a long time, but we need to make sure that they're fast paced, that they're building up that automatic recall of sounds in isolation, and then working with those sounds in the context of words. Make them really interactive. Get your students interacting with those sounds. Get them moving. Make it fun. Then we need to be also consolidating and building on that knowledge consistently through various games and activities so that students are having repeated exposure to those sounds and applying those skills. So we build them into our reading group rotations or our literacy group rotations or have phonics rotations, but just make sure you're giving your students lots and lots and lots of opportunities to practice and consolidate the skills that they're learning. We also want to make sure that we're consistently building on their knowledge. So we don't just introduce a sound for a day or a few days and then we move on. We are consistently reviewing those sounds and then building on that knowledge as we introduce new sounds. So we need to make sure that our phonics instruction is explicit, we need to make sure it's systematic and we need to make sure that it is consistent. All right, thanks so much, Tam, for sharing your insights there. Super, super helpful. I did want to touch on a few things that Tam spoke about in that mini shoot. The first one is the importance of continuing your phonemic awareness. So previously we spoke about how phonemic awareness is 100% auditory. Um, and when you start your phonics program in introducing sounds, that does not mean that you stop those phonemic awareness activities. In fact, you could use phonemic awareness activities as your warm up to your phonics lessons. So it's really important that you continue that auditory listening um, throughout your phonics program. It's important for listening skills and phoneme manipulation during those activities is super, super important. important. So what I thought I'd do is I'd share a few little things that I did in my classroom. So um, although it was a little while ago, these are still super fun activities that you can do as warm ups before you get into your phonics instruction lessons. So the first one there is beanbag toss. So I used to have three baskets. It's usually, I'd usually do CBC words. Um, so three sounds in a word. And I've just said you can use picture cards to help you with different words. So I've actually got this resource that's fairly new actually. And it's more, it's blending phonemes. So it's definitely more in the um, phonics instruction part, but they've got some really, we've got some really cute pictures of simple CVC words that is part of that resource. So it's often handy to have like a bank of all of these because I'm telling you when you get to, you go, okay, I'm gonna do a phonemic awareness activity. Coming up with those words can sometimes be hard when you've got a lot, a lot on your mind. So it's often helpful to have a bank of words that you could, prop, you could use during these phonemic awareness activities. So in this one, it's simple three baskets. You'll have to explicitly explain this to your students. Once they understand the activity, you won't have to do this all the time, but you'll explain that each basket is representing a sound in a word that you can hear. So um, they'll stand up and they'll have three baskets in front of them and you can do lots of different things with this. You could say, I want you to listen to this word. Cat. I want you to throw a bean bag into the basket that represents where the t is in the word cat. So they will then know, okay, that's in that third, that's the third sound, that's the last sound. I'm gonna throw the bean bag into that last sound. Or you could do the first sound, or if they're ready, you could do the middle sound. So you can really use this activity and change it up based on where they're at in their learning journey. So there's lots of different things you could do there. Or you could use these cards and say, okay, so we've got cat, that's gonna go on the first basket. That's gonna go on the first basket for words that start with k. This is going to go on the second basket and that's words that start with p for pig and then for 10 and then you can just list off different words and say, I want you to throw the bean bag into um, the basket that represents that sound. So if it's, you've got the 10 for t basket, any words that start with the t sound, 
you throw the bean bag into that basket. Okay, so there's lots of different things you can do. And I know that I say phonemic awareness is 100% auditory, but using little images is okay. That's fine. It's um, just making sure that they have that ability to listen to those sounds, manipulate those sounds based on what you're asking them to do. The first sound, the end sound, the middle sound, similar sounds. Um, so just having those baskets um, ready to go for some warm up activities is super cool activity to do. Uh, Jack in the box, pick a focus sound. I want you to jump out like a Jack in the box when you hear the s in these words and then you can list off some words. Um, sorting mini objects. I don't know about your students, if, you've, if you're an early years teacher or if you're not. Um, little mini objects are super, super popular. And these are just like from my favorite shop came up. So there's a little crocodile, they're just little tiny, um, they're actually little tiny erasers, star, backpack, rocket. So I've just got them in this little container ready to go. Um, and again, there's so many things that you can do with this that's just all about listening um, to the phonemes that you're saying in those words. So you could say things like, I want you to find all of the objects that start with the k sound. So then the students go through, they go, okay, I can see a cat. Um, I can see a crocodile. I can see a koala. So they pull out all the objects that they um, can hear when they pull it out. This is a k koala that starts with the k sound. I'm going to put that in the k pile. Um, if you're noticing that students are struggling to differentiate between two different sounds that they're hearing, you might put the objects that start with both those sounds and get them to sort them. So again, lots of different activities. If they're ready, you could then, if you're, you've started your phonics program and you've introduced some of your letters and sounds, you could use, you could introduce letters now. So this becomes more of a phonics activity. But again, this is where you can really differentiate these activities to suit where your students are at. Um, I actually found these cute little letters from Kmart as well. So they're all, it's in this little pack um, and they're all lowercase letters. So you could then get two of those letters out and put them out and say, I want you to find all of the objects that start with each of those sounds. So just sort of showing you how you can differentiate these phonemic awareness activities to suit your phonics program as well. Um, hula hoops, go outside if they need to jump their sillies out and have three hula hoops out. All right, we're gonna jump out these CVC words. So your consonant, vowel consonant words. We're going to jump out the word 10. So they jump t, e, n. So they're jumping into each of the hula hoops as they break down those words in, those phonemes in those sounds. Or pig. So they're just jumping it out. Um, Play-Doh, of course, Play-Doh buttons are super, super helpful as well in the early years, or Play-Doh for anything in the early years. Uh, but you could simply get them to have um, a ball of Play-Doh, break it into three different little balls. I want you to touch, and it's similar to the basket. So you, your first Play-Doh play bowl, uh, sorry, your first Play-Doh ball will be for the first sound, second for the middle sound, Third for the last sound, if you're just doing CVC words, I want you to touch the button where you can hear the g in pig. So they push the third button. So it's just that real like sort of using their hands to show that they understand um, what they're hearing and where each of those phonemes are within those words that you're using. Um, I just put a little point there, a little trick that I had that I used was I would add, again, like having these flashcards or pictures ready to go so you can grab them out, um, is also having a list of words on my lanyard. So if we were focusing on particular sounds or there was something that we really needed practice on, I would have actually have those list of words on my lanyard ready to go. So if we did have a quick five minutes where we could do an activity or I knew we were going to be doing a warm up, I'd have those words ready to go. I know it seems simple, but sometimes when you put on the spot coming up with all of those words that you really want to make sure are correct, can be really tricky. So that's a little um, trick that I did in my classroom as well. 
Um, I just popped there that I do have a blog about phonemic, other phonemic awareness activities and the different aspects. So there are lots of different aspects of phonemic awareness that need to be covered. So I really, I go into detail those different aspects like phoneme deletion, um, et cetera, in that blog. So I'll get one of the staff members to share that blog in the, um, the chat now so that you can open that up and save that if you are looking for some more information about phonemic awareness. Okay, what order should sounds be taught? We often get asked this, any phonics blog or anything that we share, people are like, but what order do we teach them in? Um, there's no one way that all the research points towards, but there are certain aspects um, where research is saying you need to make sure a few different things are covered when you decide or when you are looking for a phonics program in the order that you teach sounds. So we've just popped a few in there. So introducing short vowel sounds and common consonants straight away. So that's where Tam just spoke in her mini tute about the SAT pin and the reason why she starts with those letters in her classroom. There are other um, research articles that talk about the importance of separating easily confused letters. So that might be B and D. Um, just to begin with and then of course once the students understand those sounds you can then start to include them together so that you so that they really do have an understanding of the difference between those letters. Um, try to avoid teaching letters together that are pronounced in a similar way or sounds that are pronounced in a similar way so that might be your G and your J um, so that can get a little bit confusing for them so just trying to avoid that. And then lastly there, include continuous sounds early to help with blending practice. If you're having students who are struggling with blending, making sure that you incorporate those continuous sounds such as s and m mm will help those students learn the blending process. So just making sure you've got a couple of, it, of them in there to set the, really set them up for success when you start teaching or introducing these sounds. I have popped in here, and this is also in the blog that will point you to some suggested orders. If you've got a phonics program already at your school, you may, might already have an order that your school follows. Um, so we've got one there, which is an order that was recommended to us by a literacy coach in a blog that we wrote about with the science of reading research. Um, so I'll get one of the staff members to pop that blog in the comments section as well, if you wanna have a look at her recommendations for scope and sequence in terms of introduce, what order to introduce sounds in. The canine order of sounds is also a super, super popular one. They actually introduce capital letters as well throughout this order, which I find really interesting. Um, the Literacy Hub, I, like, I wanted to include this order because this shows that some orders do actually include digraphs um, within the order before all single sounds have been taught. Um, so that's, that's certainly one um, suggested order that some phonics programs use. But I did want to highlight Jolly Phonics Letters and Sounds, which is a UK phonics program, both begin with SAT PIN as well. What we do know is if we are wanting to teach our students and set them up for success to start reading and writing straight away, introducing A, B, C, D and E, you're not going to be able to create many words with that. That's why this order is different when we're trying to teach our kids to, kids to learn about decoding and encoding straight away. Um, that's why this, these orders are suggested, okay? I'd love to hear if you've got any other, like an order that you use that you find really helpful or if you do, if your order does include digraphs before all single sounds have been taught, um, just pop in the comments section. I'd love to hear your suggestions or just share your ideas. Okay, we will touch on sound walls now. Um, sound walls definitely weren't a thing when I was in the classroom. So this is another really um, fascinating aspect of uh, introducing phonics into the classroom and phonics instruction and how this can really visually help students when you're introducing all of these sounds to them. So a sound wall is a classroom display that is based on the different speech sounds and displayed in this way. So this is rather than the traditional way uh, word walls were created. I know I had a word wall which was in alphabetical order and I had all my sight words up there. <laughs> um, so I've done that before and you know it did work for majority of kids but there's some kids that really struggle with that. So um, lots of research has gone into when you're a phonics specific display this sound wall is certainly 
one that uh, speech pathologists, literacy coaches, um, linguist, linguistic specialists have said this is helpful in a classroom environment. Um, I do have a blog about sound walls, which I go into this a lot more in, in a lot more detail. So if this is something you want to learn more about, or um, perhaps you know a little bit more about it, but you'd like to know sort of how to introduce it into your classroom, I'll get one of the staff members to share that blog in the um, comments section. But basically, this is lovely Stephanie. She was a speech pathologist before she was a teacher, match made in heaven for in phonics instruction in the classroom. Um, but she gave me heaps of information. She's been using sound walls in her classroom for a number of years. So um, she, it was really actually fascinating where she, she talks about how it has helped her students in the classroom. But a sound wall can have an articulatory photo. So that can be used. So that's where you can see Stephanie behind her. She's got pictures of students' mouths. I sort of thought it would be cool if you could get your students, you could take photos of them making those um, different sounds and you can use their faces on the word, on the sound wall. It just makes it a little bit more special for them. Um, but you, you don't have to, this is just something that she says might help those students, particularly those that are visual learners. Um, you display a phoneme once it's been introduced. So you're not going to set up this whole wall in the classroom of all of the possible graphemes and phonemes particularly in the early stages. That's just gonna be way too overwhelming for your students. So the beauty about the sound wall is that you can set it up as you go. So as you introduce um, a phoneme, you can display it. Um, and then when a new spelling pattern is taught for that phoneme, you can add that as well. So we do have a sound wall resource. We don't have the photos, but we do have a sound wall resource that covers all of the graphemes and phonemes. Um, and the beauty about that is that each of the graphemes for one phoneme is on one separate little um, card. So you can just put it up as you go. You, some people say they introduce all of the graphemes for one phoneme. When you're first introducing sounds to little ones, that can be a little bit overwhelming. Just start with those single sounds to begin with. If some students are ready, you might like to introduce um, separately with them the different graphemes but certainly it can be a little bit overwhelming so just be guided by your students and how and where they're at um, and how they're going with their learning in their phonics program okay blending and segmenting this is where tam is going to come in again um, thank you so much tam and talk about the importance of teaching explicitly teaching our students blending and segmenting um, and she shares some really cool, quick and easy activity ideas that you can do in the classroom. And I'll also jump in after it and share some of my insights as well. So here is Tam again, sharing her insights. Okay, now we get to talk about where the magic happens, blending and segmenting. What I love about phonics is that we are not teaching students just to read a finite number of words. So we could in theory, introduce students to a set of words each week and hopefully they'd remember those words and then we could do another set of words and they'd hopefully remember those and hopefully they'd be able to read those words in books but what do they do when they come across words that we haven't taught them the beauty of phonics is that we don't need to worry about that because we are not teaching spelling lists we are teaching spelling knowledge we are teaching students the skills that they will need to unlock any word in the English language, which in turn unlocks all of the other areas of their learning. So that's why I love teaching phonics so much. And it's why I love in particular teaching the decoding part of phonics so much. What I'm going to focus on today is blending and segmenting with CVC words, which is consonant, vowel, consonant words, because that's where we would start teaching blending and segmenting skills. But what I talk about could then be applied to words with consonant digraphs, for example, ch words or sh words, or words with long vowels, or any other words that you're teaching students to blend and segment. But I'm gonna start with CVC words because that's where we would start. Now, if students are finding blending of CVC words tricky, you can pair it back even more and start with words that begin with continuant consonants. Now, these are consonants that are easier to blend because they can be stretched and blended more easily into the next sound in the word. So for example, s can be held and stretched into the next sound like in sat or in sip, or m mm can be held and blended easily into words like map and mop. In contrast, stop consonants such as k or p or d 
you're, you stop as you say that sound and you can't hold that sound in order to be able to blend it into the next sound. Now, obviously we need word, um, students to be able to read and decode words with stop consonants and continuant consonants. But if students are struggling with this concept, start with the continuant consonants and then gradually build up to incorporate some of the stop consonants as well. I'm going to show you a couple of other tips, but I'm going to flip the camera over so that you can see what I'm up to. When you're teaching students to blend sounds together, you may be familiar with students who will go something like p, a, t, tap, and they'll focus on this last sound. So a little trick for that is I'll get, I'll, whenever I have a PowerPoint that comes up when we're learning to blend these words, I will only show them these first two sounds to begin with. And we will put those two sounds together. So we'll put them together to make s, a, sa, and then I'll tell them to hold that in their head. And a lot of students will put their hand on their head to show me they're holding it in their head. And then we will add the last sound. So they'll have sat, sat. Same one here, we might have p, a, We'd put those two sounds together first, pat, pat. So that's when you're on a PowerPoint, obviously you can have it that each sound comes up individually, but if you've got words like this, you can just simply cover them up and blend those first two sounds before adding the final sound. And that little trick should hopefully help a lot of your little ones as they're first learning to blend. Segmenting is a skill that is required for writing words and spelling words. And a really great way to support students with segmenting is to have some form of manipulative. So I've got some counters here, but you could use anything. You could use gemstones, you could use pom-poms, whatever you have, Play-Doh. And this helps students to map out the sounds that they can hear first before they then work out which letter or letters are used to represent each of those sounds. So let's say we had the word fan we would map the word first and say fan. You might even have them working in some sort of grid like this, which you could have in white mats. And they would start with their manipulatives down here and then they're going to map each of the sounds. Fan. And then they're going to have a go at working out what letter or letters represents each of those sounds. So. Some students or a lot of students might be able to have a go at writing each of the sounds that they can hear. Other students, maybe you might just have the vowel sounds for them with magnets and then that just reduces one of the steps for them that they can put there and they're just focusing on writing the beginning and the end sound. For other students, I might have either some sound cards or I might have sound magnets like this and I've got all of our target sounds in front of them and then they are able to build the word rather than needing to write the word. So for example, here, we would make the word using the magnets. So we'd go and like this. And for some students, maybe I would give them this part and I'd say, I need you to work out what sound do we need to make fan? And they would find the beginning sound or maybe I would give them this fan what's the last sound that you're going to need and they would need to find the n or maybe you give them this and they write that sound there are so many different ways that you can differentiate this to support each of your students but i definitely recommend particularly when you're first teaching segmenting or for students who are struggling with this definitely having the manipulatives but then also having some supports and scaffolds like um, flashcards like this or magnets so that students can be building the words before they then write the words. Awesome. Thanks so much, Tam, for those fantastic ideas. A few little hints and tips I wanted to point out from um, moving on from Tam's amazing ideas that you can buy magnetic paper. So from Officeworks, I think it's about $25 for five sheets, but if you're just creating little letter tiles, you can get quite a lot out of that. But it's actually paper you can print on um, and it's a, mag it's, a, it's a magnet. Like gone are the days of printing them out and laminating them and cutting them. This is like, I just could not believe this. So I thought I had to share it with you. If you are wanting to create some letter tiles, you can then make sure that it's in your school font if that's something that your school really likes you to do. Um, and I'll get one of the team members just to drop the actual resource that I used to print these magnetic tiles um, in the chats function as well. But I just thought that's a super easy way 
Um, you can create your own letter tiles and have them like in their little containers, different sets in containers. So you've got them ready to go when you want to do that um, real explicit teaching of blending and segmenting with your students. Okay, Play-Doh buttons, I spoke about them before with the uh, using them for phonemic awareness, but of course they're also fantastic for blending and segmenting and teaching your students that and really giving them that sensory way of learning to blend and segment. So with the action, I'll play this video in a minute, but the action is of pushing down for each sound to segment the sounds, but then actually rolling the Play-Doh to blend it together. So I'll show you this video. So this is for the word sat. So you can see I'm pushing down each of the buttons for s at and then coming along and we're going to blend that together. S at sat. So you're blending it together. So super easy, like Play-Doh is a must. I used to have, actually I used to have some of my parent helpers make up Play-Doh at the start of each term and we'd have um, a little plastic container of homemade Play-Doh for each of the students. They literally had it on their desk all the time because I used Play-Doh for, every, for everything. Um, so yeah, that's definitely something that's helpful to have. Okay, now we do have some really cute resources on the website that, that can support and help you in um, teaching your students blending and segmenting, but also giving them lots and lots of practice of blending and segmenting. So we have these cute little um, mats, which I'll get one of the, the staff to share in the comments section now. There's a variety of themes as well. So I think there's this space, there's a bee, I think there's frogs jumping on lily pads, um, but there's a little destination for each of them. So for the bees, the destination is a hive, the planets, the destination, is earth so it's sort and the rocket flies along or the bee jumps on each of the flowers and then flies along from the line at the bottom to blend so you can see the word there bag and you can break up that bag on the flowers so the bees landing on each of the flowers and then we're going to blend that together down the bottom bag um, so we've got heaps of those little word cards are available. You can create your own. Um, again, you don't have to have the words there. So if you are sort of doing that real auditory listening, phonemic awareness, you could still use these mats. Um, so lots of different ways to use that resource. Okay, tricky words. This is Tam's final tute where she's going to talk about tricky words, what they are. Um, why the research is shifting away from sight words as they were typically taught. Um, the, she'll touch on orthographic mapping, which is the definition I gave at the start of this webinar. Um, she'll talk about how most parts in high frequency words are actually decodable. So a, a lot of high frequency words can be decoded, but there are some that have those tricky spelling patterns. So she'll talk about how she teaches those tricky parts to her students in this tute. Thanks, Tam. Now we're going to talk about tricky words. These are high frequency words with tricky or irregular spellings. You may have heard these words referred to as sight words, but educational practice all around the world has been really shifting in the last few years and educators have been moving away from traditional methods for teaching these words, which were essentially rote memorization, where the belief was if students were exposed to a word enough times, they would learn that word. And for some students they do, but for a lot of students, and we all know those students, which doesn't matter how many times we show them that word and we practice that word and we have all these different games and activities and try to get them to remember a word, they don't remember it. Or for other students, it works, but it takes so many exposures to that word before they remember it. So the process has moved to a more research-based method based around how the brain learns to read and how the brain stores words so that it's automatically able to retrieve those words when it's reading. And that is through a process of orthographic mapping, where you are mapping out all of the different sounds in a word and you are finding the tricky part of that word. Now, the great news is that if we're teaching phonics and we're teaching decoding skills, we're already doing that. So all we need to do is take those skills that we are using anyway and apply them to the tricky words and identify the tricky parts in those words. The other great news is that most tricky words 
only have one or two sounds that don't adhere to common spelling patterns and that, that are actually the tricky part. So most of those high frequency words are decodable. And what we need to do is just identify the part that is a little bit tricky. And it might be tricky purely because students haven't yet been exposed to that spelling pattern. So for example, at the start of when students are first learning to read and they're just working with single sounds, then they won't know, for example, the A-Y makes the A sound, like in day and play. But once they've been exposed to the long A spelling, long A sound and all of the different spellings, then that word becomes a decodable word for them. So what we do is we map out the word, we work out how many sounds are in the word, and then we identify the tricky part of that word. And this will help students to store those words so much more easily than if we're just saying, you need to remember that word. You may hear the words referred to as heart words, and that's because they are words with a part that we need to learn by heart. And so I'm going to show you a couple of ways that we can map out these heart words so that students can store those words and remember those words in a far more effective way than if we're just telling them to memorize them. So I'm going to show you how you might introduce or explicitly teach a tricky word, so a high frequency word with a tricky spelling. So on your board, you might have some post-it notes that are going to represent each of the sounds in a word. And let's say we're thinking about the word said. So you're going to map out the sounds in the word said. S, e, d. There are three sounds in the word said. Then you're going to discuss the way that we spell each of those sounds. So what is the common way of spelling the s sound? And we would say the s there. What is the way, the most common way or the way we would normally represent the d sound? And we would do a d. Then you would discuss this middle e sound and students might say we usually represent the e sound with an e. And then you would show them that in this word we represent the e sound with a i. So this is the tricky part of the word. We might draw a little heart above that part of the word because this is the tricky part that we need to know by heart. So in this process we've then been able to decode the word said We've identified the tricky part of the word, the bit that we need to know by heart, and we've mapped out each of the sounds so that students know three sounds in the word said and the tricky part of the sound, which is the A-I. Counters are another really great way to map out tricky words. And if you've got double-sided ones, then you can use them to tap the sounds and then to turn over as you work out how to represent each of the sounds. So for example, let's do the word his. We tap the sounds, h, i, z, his. And then we're going to turn over each counter as we work out how to spell that part of the word. So we've got h, or the, that part of the word. We've got i. And then this part of the word, his. We might be tempted to do a z, but actually, this is the tricky part of the word. We are going to use an s. So we might do a little heart to remind ourselves that that is the tricky part of the word. Another good tip for when you're introducing these words is to focus on words with a similar spelling pattern. So at the same time as teaching his, you might also be focusing on is and was. So that students are then learning to apply that same spelling pattern to each of these tricky high frequency words. All right, thanks so much, Tam, for that final mini tute. I'm sure you'll agree that they were super insightful, those tutes. Um, I was really, really excited when she agreed to do them for us. Um, so thanks so much again, Tam. And do give her a follow on Instagram. Her handle is Miss Learning B. Um, so she's yeah, definitely a teacher that I have followed and I've learned from um, throughout the last few years as well. Um, just put a little hot tip there. You might like to check out our Tricky Word Sound Button Cards. So we do have this resource on the website and I'll get one of the team members to share the link to this resource as well. If you're a little bit stuck and you're like, I don't even know which words I should be focusing on or what order to do them in or um, just want a starting point, these are a great starting point. So they're um, words that have been picked or handpicked by um, one of our resource producers as um, I guess those high frequency words that do have tricky spellings and different ways to pronounce those tricky spellings. We've actually highlighted in red those tricky parts and put a little red star on those so that it really highlights the tricky part in that word. 
finally, um, I just wanted to share some other resources that we've got on the website that you might like to check out that would help during your phonics instruction journey. Um, so we do have, and I'll jump to the website, might go a little bit over, um, apologize for that, but um, I will jump to the website just to show you where you can find these resources as well. And as I said, said earlier, I do have a blog that I've put all of this information in, including Tam's videos and some other videos. And as I said, if you didn't have any of your, que your questions answered during this webinar, please join our Facebook page over on, T it's called Teacher Talk. And I'll be on there after this webinar answering any questions that you might have. Um, so these teaching resources that I've got highlighted here, we have the sound button card. So they're similar to the tricky words resource that I just shared earlier in the earlier slide, but they're just, they're decodable words and they actually go up in um, ability levels. So we've got a collection like the purple collection you can see there where we have used the sat pin. We've used a, a particular order for the way that you might introduce those sounds. So the purple ones only use the letters sat pin. So they're just a great way um, to really sh help your students being able to decode um, real words. So they feel like they're reading or well, they are reading. And that's it's, it's all about building that confidence as well with your students. So they're at different levels and I'll show you where you can get that, that resource as well. We also have some fantastic decodable texts. So again, these are gr a great way to help your students really understand that notion of reading, but at a level that's suitable for them. So um, at the top of the, each of the de decodable texts, we do have a tricky words uh, list. So that will sort of highlight to the students, hey, these are some tricky words. Now they might not be that you can't decode them, they might just have aspects in those words that the students haven't learnt yet, as Tam was saying before. So um, they are also split into levels and there's a little comprehension question, a little self-reflection um, at the bottom as well. So they are definitely something that I would have used in my classroom um, when, when I'm introducing phonics and to really guide that reading process with your students. All right, do we have time? Might just quickly go onto the website, just to show you where you can find some of these resources. So when you go to the home page, if you go to learning areas at the top, then you can go to English. And then over here on the left, phonics is number one. Great. <laughs> um, we know it's super important, so it's at the top there. Um, so what you can do is you can actually sort these resources by popularity. So this is where um, you'll really see those resources that teachers are loving and using. You can see there we've got the phonics sound wall display, which I showed you earlier. You can see we've got the decodable texts and all the different. So if I click on this one, you can see that this is set one and this is just single graphemes. So that's for those students that have only learnt single graphemes. So any of the tricky words that are in there are either those tricky words that have a spelling pattern that's difficult or perhaps it's got digraphs or trigraphs the students haven't learnt yet. So you can guide them through and help them with those tricky words before they start reading. Then you get down to, so here are the decodable sound button flashcards, which I was showing you. So there's over a hundred of them and you can see the different colors and what each of those colors, what letters they're focusing on or what they include. You've got your segmenting and blending mats there. So that's the really cute mats that I was showing you earlier. And then when your students are getting super, super confident or perhaps for those older year levels, we've got phoneme spotter stories as well. So they actually need to look for particular phonemes in those texts. Word building, the tricky words. Yep, yeah, so there's heaps. I could, I could keep going. I could keep going. There's so many fantastic resources, but I won't. So that's just some of our phonics and your phonics resources that are on the website. Um, as I said earlier, um, we will share the blog where all of this information is. You'll notice that you'll get um, sent to that after this webinar. So hopefully that's helpful. Any questions, jump on that Teacher Talk Facebook group. Um, I hope this was helpful. It's super tricky to try and make sure that it's going to be suitable for everyone that joins us. But I hope that if you're an early years teacher that's highly experienced, I hope you got something out of that, even if it was a few activity ideas. Um, if you're an upper years teacher, you never know, next year you might be teaching prep, prep or year one. Um, 
and I think it's just important to get that um, that research-based, evidence-based practice, keeping our skills updated as well. So hopefully that was helpful. Thank you so much for joining us again for this webinar um, and I will see you around. Thank you.